Welcome to Untold Stories of the Torah, a masterclass in Jewish history, presented by Rabbi Shmuel Aber. Part two of the story of Shimshon. So far, Manoach, at the end of the previous podcast, Manoach prays to Hashem. He's very distressed that he hasn't gotten the chance to speak to the angel. And for whatever the reasons were, as we mentioned, Manoach desperately wanted to speak to the angel himself. And so he begs Hashem. And that day, whenever he prayed to Hashem, respectively, based on the different opinions, whatever the day that he prayed to Hashem, that very day, the angel came back, back to Salal Foynes, and told Salal Foynes to go, to go get a husband. She, got, she went and got a husband. Her husband followed her. Again, depending on which opinion you follow, whether that means quite literally following after her in the street, or if it just means like Rabbi Nachman by Yitzchak and like Rashi brings down in the in the story itself, just following after her advice where where the angel could be found, they found the angel. And now Manoach gets his chance to talk to the angel. And he says three things. Number one, after very clearly assessing that Hashem has sent the angel back as a response to his prayers, which means that this man, he, again, he's still under the assumption that this is a man, this man is clearly having conversations with Hashem because how else would he know to come right back? The Mitzvah Stavis says, now that Hashem has sent you back based on my prayers, I could see, says Manoach, this is clearly from Hashem, and so therefore Manoach invokes, he says, let your words actually happen. He almost says, like, now I know what's going to happen. Now I know this is all real, because how else would you have known to come right back? Your words are, or your words are obviously going to be fulfilled, because you really are a man of God. And then he asked two other questions. There's two separate questions. What shall be the way of the child? The laws of the child. The direction, the... the Order of the child. The Marvin says, the first time you came, Maner said, you spoke to Salal Fadis, how she should behave. But this time, Maner said, I want you to tell me, how should the child behave? Now, there are many, many different ways of breaking up these two questions. What exactly and precisely um, Manoach was asking of the, of the angel, of the, of the man of God, as he believed it to be. The Mama says, what special things will he do? Is what is, and what is his, his Uma Sayu and his deeds? What does that mean? What special things will he do? The Barbanel says, if this child was born in such a miraculous and dramatic way, I mean, an angel came to, to, to talk about his coming and then came back a second time, he's obviously destined to incredibly special things. And the Barbanel says, Manoach was challenging the angel, okay, tell me what's going to happen special to this child because he's clearly destined for something great. Now, of course, it's very important to mention at this point or to re-mention at this point that Salalfoinis got a lot more information from the angel than than she gave over to Manoach. So Manoach is missing a lot of pieces of information and a lot of the questions he's asking he wouldn't really ask had Salfoinis, his wife, actually given him all the information. We know that as the as the you know the reader of the story, but Manoyach himself is very much in the dark because his wife gave him big pieces of information of what the angel said, but not everything. And some of the questions he's asking now, we already know that they've been answered. What's he destined to do? He's supposed to be the one to start to save the Jewish people from the Plishtim. But of course, Manoach doesn't know that. Medjah Shraba says, mishpat hanaru ma he said, the, the two questions were, were, what type of nazir should the child keep once he's born? And what does Tzalalfoinis need to keep while she's pregnant with him? He was very confused. There was a lot of, um, a, a lot of um, ambiguity when it, came, when it came to what type of nazir his wife needs to keep and his son needs to keep. And that's, according to many opinions, what bothered Manoach in the first place. What his wife was telling him was so confusing because he knew the basic principles of nausea, what, what makes up a nausea. One of them, for example, being that not allowed to come in contact with dead. And he was wondering, okay, that obviously doesn't seem to apply. So what else doesn't seem to apply? What does, what doesn't? It's, it, was very, it's, it was all strange to him. 
So what, the, what does the angel respond? The angel responds, Mikola isha tishamer. Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful of. She shouldn't eat for anything that comes to the vine, neither, neither a d- wine or strong d- drinks, nothing unclean. All that I commanded her, she should observe. What you notice is very interesting is the angel didn't really make, he didn't really answer the question. All the angel really said, aside from repeating, you know, the main thing about not having wine and, and unclean things, the answer the angel really said is everything I told the woman, that's your answer. Why are you asking me? It's almost like the angel's trying to tell Manoyach, <clears throat> I already answered these questions. Medjish in fact, says that the response was to give honor to Salal Fainis. Manoyach was, was, you know, kind of questioning, questioning her um, ability to understand what the angel was saying. And the Medjish says the angel purposely said, everything I told the woman she should be careful of, that was a way for the angel to tell Manoyach, your wife, she knows what she's doing. And the angel was hoping to endear Salalafoinis to her husband. That Manoach would now start to treasure her more because, look, this is someone who, who knows how to take um, directions from an angel very precisely to such a degree that when the angel comes back, the angel says, I already told her it's fine. The Bible now, in fact, says that the, the, that the angel tried to brush off Manoach's questions in regards to the futures and the destiny of the child. The Manoach wanted to know, okay, that obviously this child must be um, ready to do something really, really great. What's he going to do? And the Barbanos, the Barbanos answers it like in the name of the, of the angel that we don't have business in the end of days and trying to work out what future events are supposed to happen, what your child is supposed to become. We're here for the here and now, and there's no reason for you to start getting all caught up wondering what destiny your son has. That's not important. So the angel didn't answer that question, even though, according to the Bible, that is what Manoach wanted to know. He wanted to know what special things are my son going to do because he's clearly destined for something great. The Mamla says that the angel was warning Manoach to also keep the laws of Naziros as an extra precaution to prevent his wife from forgetting. Mikola share amarti ala isha tishamer that Manoyach himself should actually guard himself. He should keep the same laws as well. And that way, as a family, they'll all be able to keep each other strong. And so long as she was pregnant, Manoyach would be able to be, able to be there to make sure that they were all strong in it. And then once the boy was born at that point, of course, Shimshin was his own person. And the, the, the laws of, of nausea didn't apply to the parents anymore, as I understand. And there is indication later on that that's actually the case. And other, other mamlas also brings down that some of us didn't say that, it didn't mean that Manoyach was actually had to, had to keep the laws, but the angel was telling her, to, telling him, help your wife keep the laws, make it easier for her, aid her in keeping the laws of Nasiris while she's still pregnant. Now, again, I'm going to repeat this again, that Manoach was not aware that he was dealing with an angel of Hashem. He was, in his mind, it was, a, it was a man, a human being, a messenger of Hashem, a prophet and a human. So Manoach now, here's the good news, here's the prophecy. He wanted a lot more information, but the messenger of Hashem was very much not forthgiving. And so, but he was so grateful. And so, Wanting to honor the prophet, he told he asked the prophet, "Can I bring you at our, at their house? Can I offer you a young goat as a, as a gift, and we'll, we'll have a meal together?" The Barabinol even says that Manoir was a little more a little more um, um, to, 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 um, um, manipulative, let's call it, in his invitation, in the hope that he could invite the prophet to his house. He'd give him a nice good meal, and while he's eating and while they're enjoying themselves, he could start to pry him for more information. He needed to get the answers to his questions, and the prophet wasn't being forthcoming. So therefore, invite him to a meal, you know, make him very happy, and then hopefully get more information. And it was very clear, says Al Barbanel, that the messenger of Hashem was very keen to leave. So Manir now needed to stall him. Mom Les says Manoach just wanted the merit of, of providing hospitality for a terrorist scholar. As I'm going to mention later on, for a person to reach levels in prophecy, they had to, they had to be an incredible human being on so many levels. And of course, being um, highly steeped in Torah is a, is a baseline requirement. And so therefore, Manoach understood this was, this was a great terrorist scholar and therefore he wanted to honor him. 
The Malbim says that Manoach already started to get a little bit suspicious about the messenger. By no means did he really believe that this was an angel. But he he had a little suspicion that maybe something was a little a little funny here. And maybe it wasn't a, a, a prophet. Maybe, in fact, it was an angel. And so at this point, he decides, he decides to, to phrase his questions in such a way that if it's a prophet, you stay and have a meal. And if it's an angel, let's make a sacrifice together. So already from the angel's response, you suddenly start to see, okay, why is the angel getting on the, the, the defense so quickly and getting so aggressive and then mentioning things about sacrifices? The Malbim says, Manoach already kind of started that pattern. And Manoach already kind of orchestrated his question in such a way, just on the off chance that perhaps this was an angel, Manoach phrased this question, leaving it room for both possibilities. That perhaps it's a prophet, perhaps it's an angel. And the angel, of course, responded very, very sharply. If you detain me, I'm not going to eat from your bread. Angels don't eat. And if you prepare a burnt offering, offer it to Hashem. Why are you offering it to me? The Medjish Rabbah says in the case of Avram Avinov, famously, the angels came and they ate, or pretended to eat at least. And why in the case of Manoach, the angel very defensively says, absolutely not, if you're going to detain me, I'm not going to eat from your bread. So Medjish Rabbah, Mam Lez brings this down as well. The Medjish Rabbah says in the case of Manoach, the angel had offered a service. He'd given some good news to Manoach. And now Manoach was offering thanks. The angel said, all thanks goes to Hashem. In the case of Avraham Avinu, nothing had been offered. It was just hospitality. Avraham Avinu saw people walking down the street or walking in the desert and he offers them to come in. Nothing had been, there'd been no service given. There was no reason for Avraham to be grateful to these people. Therefore, there was no gratitude given. It was just pure unadulterated hospitality. In that case, the angel sat down and ate. But over here, the angel says, wait a second. If it's about thanks, thanks only goes to Hashem. The Radak also says that in that generation, people were sacrificing to other gods. So the second um, angel had to t- heard the word or the idea of sacrificing came up, the angel had to make it abundantly clear to Manayach that sacrifices only need to be to Hashem and nobody and nothing and absolutely nowhere else. Mutsudas David says the angels, the angel, this angel that came to visit Manayach and his wife, wanted to leave. And he said, regardless of Manoach's motivations, he was going to leave. And if you offer me food, I'm not going to eat. And if you make a sacrifice, sacrifice to Hashem. The, the angel wanted to leave, and Manoach's um, disturbances, and Manoach's ploys and tricks, the angel, according to the Messiah David, was, wasn't interested in that. So now, Manoach's running out of, he's running out of options. The angel's literally about to leave, and Manoach wants to honor him, firstly. He wants, he has so much gratitude. Again, remember, it's very important. Manoach does not know this as an angel. If it was an angel, it'd be a different story. It'd be a whole different conversation. But Manoach just thinks it's a prophet, a, a man, a man of God very much, but a man nonetheless, who traveled all the way to give him news on behalf of Hashem, and he wants to honor him, and he wants to give him, you know, um, gratitude for his part that he played. And so Manoach says, okay, if you're not going to at least uh, let me honor you with, with a meal, at least let me know your name. That way, when I retell the story, this is going to become an incredible story. I mean, it's a story we're still staying, we're still, we're still staying almost 3,000 years later. But Manoach understood this was an amazing event. Decades after him and his wife ha- uh, uh, haven't had any children, suddenly they're going to have a child, and clearly it's going to be a very special child. And people are going to ask, tell me the story. Manoach said, the least I could do is, is men- mention your name, and people will say, oh, that's the person who proph- um, prophesies that Manoach and his, and his wife's cell phones would have a child. So he says, what's your name? And the angel, again, was difficult according to some opinions, and we'll get to that in a moment. He, he said, why do you ask after, after my name? It's unknowable. Vuhu feli. It's, un, it's unknowable. The Alsha says that Manoach was starting to get suspicious about the, about, the, about the messenger. It's really interesting. When he asked the angel's name, he didn't ask, Mashamecha, what is your name? That's the way you say it in Hebrew. He said, Mishamecha, who is your name? That's not the correct word. That's not the correct way to say it. It doesn't really make sense to say Misha Mecha, but that's what it says in the verse. And of course, everyone reading will just say, "Yeah, yeah that's it's the same thing." Who who is your name? Instead of what is your name, it's it's it's, it's pretty close. It's pretty much there. I mean, it's only one letter off. The Al Sheikh says that Manoach was was 
same thing that Marvin said earlier. We're starting to get a little suspicious about this person. Again, very far from that, from realizing that this indeed was an angel. But he started having ideas that maybe, perhaps, it was an angel. And so he remembered that when the angel came to visit Avraham, it was Malach Michal that gave the good news to Sarah that the that the that they will have a son and they have a son Yitzchak. And so he thought to himself, if this was an angel, very likely it's Malach Michal. So instead of saying Ma Shemecha, he said Mem Yud, Michal, like the first two letters, Michal Shemecha, your name is Michal. He already started having a funny little feelings that this could be an angel. The Abarabinam says, so and the mom said, so the angel realized that he wanted to ask his name for, for honor, and he said, I don't want, I don't, why are you ask my name? I don't want honor. Like, again, the same thing. He's trying to honor him, and the angel's saying, I don't want honor. So he said, okay, I'll honor you with your name. At least tell me what your name is, and that way I'll be able to tell. And the angel, again, realizes this, this is just a ploy to get honor, and he doesn't want honor. So he says, honor belongs to Hashem. I don't want honor. And so he refuses to give the, to give the name. That's according to many opinions. Now, the name Feli, unknowable, uh, covered. Let's talk about the different opinions. Rashi, for example, says the word feli means concealed. Why concealed? Because it constantly changes. Angels don't have set names for the most part. Based on what they're doing, their name changes. Rashi says it's concealed because the angel said, I don't even know what's going It might be changed. It's going to be, I don't even know what it's going to be called today. It's going to be changed again. And there was another Rashi, a very famous Rashi in Bereshis, where Yaakov is fighting against the angel, and Yaakov asks for the angel's name. The angel's asking Yaakov, why are you asking for my name? And Rashi, of course, jumps in, and Rashi says, the reason why the angel's telling Yaakov, why are you asking my name, is because angels just don't have set names. They have missions, and every time their mission changes, their name changes with it. So... It's constantly revolving. They have revolving names. The read Rabbi Shai Mitrani says it's concealed from people. That's the reason why he said the the who feli. It's concealed. It's covered. It's it's concealed from people. It's not something a human beings could understand. Medrash Shabbos says there's no reason to ask my name. You're not seeing me again. Names are for people. When you see them, you're gonna see them again. Oh, that's your name. Okay, and now we can start a conversation and we can have a repertoire. There's no the angel was telling. Manoich, there's no repertoire to be have here. There's no conversation to be continued. I'm going and you're never going to see me again. The Mitzvah's David said it's hidden and it shouldn't be revealed. That's what the, that's what the angel said. Why are you asking my name? It's not supposed to be revealed. So why, why are you asking my name? Mamla says that the angel himself was the one to conceal it, seeing that this was going to somehow give credit away from Hashem. The angel said, if that's the objective, that I'm concealing. I'm not telling you my name anymore. That's it. And then now brings us to the last opinion. It's two different opinions, but it's the, the same idea which really changes the game. Because until now, we're under the assumption that the angel is not playing ball with, with Manoyach. But according to the Malbim, the Malbim says, no, exactly the opposite. The angel told Manoyach, you want to know my name? All right, sure. I'll tell you my name. For who? Feli. My name is Feli. When the angel said Feli, it didn't mean concealed and wondrous and all those things. It means that too. But that also, that was the name of the angel. The angel's name is Feli. He did wondrous things, says the, says the Malbim. Therefore, his name is one. Therefore, his name is wondrous. Feli means wondrous, and that that was actually his name. The Malbim brings down another another opinion based on Bamidbar Rabbah, and it says the reason why his name is Feli is because in the pasuk, in the actual verse dealing with making. The nausea vows, the word feli is used. In fact, the angel is asking Manoah, now you can reread the, the, the verse again. He says, Why are you asking after my name? Vuhu feli. The angel's not criticizing Manoah, he's bewildered by Manoah's lack of, under, of easy understanding. He says, It's so obvious what my name is. I came here to make your son a nausea. I invoked Nazirus. Open up the book of uh, the book of the Torah that deals with the zeros and the word Feli is there. There you go. That's obviously my name. So why are you why are you even asking my name? After this, Manoach brings a carbon, and he takes a young goat, he takes flower offering, and he offers it up as a rock to Hashem. Manoach saw that the angel wasn't going to prepare the meal that he he wanted to prepare for him. Again, still not, not still not knowing that this was an angel, or at least not certain that this was an angel. And Yalk Shemoni says 
that Manoach was very concerned because the angel had told him, if you want to um, uh, offer the, the goat, offer it to Hashem. So now a prophet had told him, in Manoach's mind, a prophet had told him that he had permission to sacrifice an altar in his house. Now, there's, there were two opinions at that time, whether you're, you were allowed to bring a sacrifice outside of the Mishkan, which was in Shiloh at the time, or whether you, whether you are or whether you aren't. Now, Manoach was very concerned that you're not allowed to, but now a prophet comes and tells him, and this is a prophet that he's verified now as a prophet, comes and tells him, you're allowed to do it. Now, the rule is, pro- prophets aren't allowed to break Torah and Mitzvahs, absolutely not. It's forbidden. But they are allowed to make one-time exceptions. If they come and they tell a person, I was instructed by God to tell you that you, that, that you should do such and such one particular time, this particular sin. Very, most famously, a very similar type of example is Elioh and Navi. Elioh and Navi was instructed to bring a sacrifice on Har Carmel and the Beis HaMikdash existed. This is many years, many, many years later. And the Beis HaMikdash existed. And he brought a sacrifice on Har Carmel which is absolutely forbidden, but it was a one-time event. That one-time event exception was absolutely fine because a prophet greenlit it. In this case, Manoach now has been, has been greenlit to make a sacrifice outside of the Mishkan. So even according to the opinion that, you're, that one isn't allowed to bring a sacrifice during the times of the Mishkan, which isn't as serious as the base of Mikdash times, of course, even according to the opinion that it was still forbidden, in this case, he's, he's greenlit to do it. He's allowed to do it. So, He's now allowed to actually bring this sacrifice. The Mamla says, even though the angel or the messenger of God, because this we're still going in Manoach's perspective here, said it's permitted, he was still very uncertain. So what did he do? He placed he, the, the young goat on the rock. He put the meal offering on the god on, on the rock, but he didn't actually light the fire. There are other opinions that said they didn't have a fire, but the, according to Mamlaz, it sounds like he, it could have a, he could have arranged a fire, but put rocks together, whatever it took, but he didn't do that. He, the, his rationale that this is a special carbon, this is a special sacrifice from God, the fire should come about in a, in a special way. If it doesn't come about, that's my sign that I shouldn't be doing this. And then the angel brings the fire himself. The, the angel does wondrous things, or mafli lasso is actually interesting. Interestingly, according to the opinion of the Malwin, it says, Mafila says, Feli was the name of the angel. Feli did wondrous things, which again fits into the verse really beautifully. And Manoach and his wife looked on as the angel did wondrous things. He basically brought the fire. The angel watching Manoach do the whole sacrifice, but not actually do the, have the fire itself. The Radak, the Abarban, the Sudistavid, Many others that says the Malach does what, did wondrous things. He made fire come from the rock, and it went up, and it went up in, and and then to finish off the spectacle, the angel himself went up with the fire. The Abarbanel says, "Umafil says, Feli did what he did. Manerch did his part. Feli did his part, and Manerch and his wife watched on." The Rid says Manur didn't have a way to make fire come. I mentioned that earlier on. And the Malach stretched out his arm and burnt it. And the Al Sheikh, very interesting, asked, asked the big um, elephant question in the room, and that is that Malach had made it so abundantly clear that he didn't want to be a part of the sacrifice because he didn't want it to be any form of misunderstanding that sacrifices are made to angels and he said, if you're going to make a sacrifice, sacrifice it to God, you don't need me to be around. In fact, I'd rather not be around at all. And yet, somehow, now he's very much present. What's going on? So the Al-Sheikh actually makes it very clear that they all stood very far away during the sacrifice and then made it clear that this sacrifice is actually for Hashem. So the, the Al-Sheikh actually qu- asks that question, answers that question, but also gives us a good idea of what the sacrifice looked like with all of them standing away. And the angel did whatever he had to do, but it wasn't... It wasn't that it didn't look in such a way that it would be any form of misgiving that Manoach and his wife were making a sacrifice to an angel, Chas Shalom. The angel leaves. The flame went up towards the sky. The angel went into the flames of the actual, of the, of the Mizbeach. And when Manoach and his wife saw this experience of the angel literally divesting itself of physicality and and not it's so much more than disappearing, but you know, divesting of physicality, they fell on their face to the ground. 
And the angel didn't appear to Manoach anymore. And at this point, Manoach now understood that it was a Malach of Hashem. He realized, I've been talking to an angel the entire time. The Malam says that Manoach and his wife saw the actual experience of the angel divesting from physicality and rising to heaven. They saw things that people don't usually see, people never see. And this is a much greater experience than just seeing their angel. Many people saw angels, but this was an incredible experience. They saw the actual removal of physicality of the angel. And it's, it's an experience that the physical eye is it's impossible for a human eye to see this. What's interesting is the, the Marvin gives an a, a interesting you know, ex, example of something similar happened in history. Elio told his student Elisha many, many hundreds of years later, he told his student he wanted to bless him, that he would have double his amount of miracles. All the different miracles that Elio and Avi was blessed with, he told his student, I'd love for you to be blessed with double. But how would you know if this is fulfilled? If you see me actually get taken and going to heaven, having the experience of divesting from physicality and going to heaven, then that's your sign that you're actually going to get that blessing, the, the, the blessing of, of double my miracles. And Elisha actually got to see it. And that's how he knew that he was going to get that, that incredible measure of blessings that he did get. Now, Barbano very quickly points out the the... The detail in the verse, it says, Then Manoach knew that it was an angel of God. That's very specific, says the angel. Manoach finally realized, but his wife, what about his wife? His wife knew the whole time. Rabbi says this is so clear that, the, that his wife knew the whole time. She said earlier already, she hinted to her husband, his appearance was like the appearance of an angel. And uh, Barmano points out that the, the, the opinions that say that Manoach was an ignoramus, that he was Amar Aretz, you could set the... The fact that he couldn't sense it was an angel until finally the angel went up in, up in flames and disappeared, that already, that points to that same, that same idea that Manoach wasn't of the highest of highest cal caliber. The Mabam says that Manoach waited by the fire to actually see if the messenger would return. And when he finally didn't return, at that point, Manoach realized, okay, this is actually uh, um, an actual angel. Now, it wouldn't, this, this conversation wouldn't be complete if I didn't drop a massive bombshell. A, a controversial opinion, it's beyond controversial on the entire topic. I'm not going to go through the entire topic relearning, relearning it through the eyes of the Raul Bag. But at the same time, to not mention his opinion would be, would be a real a disservice. The Raul Bag's opinion is that this messenger the whole time was not an angel. It's very hard to learn through some of the verses with this opinion. At least I, I struggled with it myself. But he says it wasn't an angel. It was actually a prophet. So what's going on? The Raul Bag posits that this could be Pinchas, who was living a very long, hundreds of years already, good 300 years, over 300 years at least. And why? So what was going on? He had a message from Hashem. And the message, of course, is real. We know that Shimshon ends up becoming one of the greatest Jewish heroes in history. So the message was real. The message was from Hashem. But Pinchas was worried. He was worried that Manoach and Salafonis wouldn't take his message so seriously if they just thought he was a regular prophet. So he said, if I make it appear like I'm an angel, they'll take it a lot more seriously. So the Raul Bag said that he didn't eat from their food because he wanted them to believe it was an angel. He, he did everything that an angel would do because he said, I want them to think this is an angel. He hid his name because he didn't want to tell them the name. He has to tell them the name, then he has to tell them, okay, I'm Pinchas. And that once, that once, they would know straight away, it's Pinchas, it's not an angel. And he knew they'd much more readily listen if there was an angel. So it's an incredible opinion. It really shakes up the whole story. But that's the Raubach's opinion on 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 this actual event. Now, of course, the angel goes into the fire and Manoach becomes exceptionally panicked. He says to his wife, Moish Damos, we're sure they're going to pass away because we've seen Hashem. They saw an angel. They saw such a holy experience, such a, such a uh, raw spirituality. And Manoach said, how is it possible that we're going to actually survive this and be able to stay alive? And Salafoinus so gave a very calculated um, response. The response is in three parts. 
the verses literally you could split it in three parts and and i'm gonna i'm gonna go like the marble but it, you could see the division very easily she says like this if hashem wanted to, to die why would he accept our carbon so point number one is yes it was a very spiritual event but Hashem actually accepted the carbon. Fire came and, and accepted the carbon. We didn't place the fire. That's the that's the sign. That's the global, international, timeless sign of acceptance of a of a sacrifice. If Hashem wanted to, if, if Hashem was um, trying to show us signs of favor and love, like the Marbam says, that's how he did it. And this, the, accepting our sacrifice is not a sign of anger and punishment. We're clearly not going to die. Number two, why would he have shown us all these miracles? Does Hashem make miracles like the Bible says? Does, the, does Hashem make miracles for the dead? What use is miracles for the dead? And number three, her th- the third response was, Hashem wouldn't have made such an announcement for us. Obviously, we're supposed to live, the Bible explains, obviously, we're supposed to live and have a son. And that's the reason why we had this special announcement. It's not for us to die right now. And it's actually, our Barabinel points out, it's precisely this exchange between the two, which is a clear indication that Tzalal Foynes was far, far wiser than her husband. What's interesting is the words mois namus. Mois namus means we will surely die. It doesn't mean will die. It means we will surely die. But it, it, there's a double connotation in that. And the, the, there's two, the, the Chamas Anach and the Avas Yonason, the Chida and the Yonason Apshas, they both wonder why is the double language, most Namus will surely die. The Chida says the first death that Manoach is talking about is the fact that they have that they that they have no children. And the second death is a literal death that he expects to drop dead after seeing this incredible experience. So that's why he uses a double expression. The Avas Yonason, the Yonason Apshas, he says he says like this, the power to make a a one-time exception, is given to a Navi, a known Navi. And a prophet like Eliyahu Navi is able to make an exception and say, right now we're going to build a, a altar on top of our, Mount Carmel, for example, and we're going to sacrifice to God. And because he's a prophet, he's able to invoke this Torah power and enable Torah to be put aside temporarily. Of course, th- this rule can never be done ever for idolatry, but for everything but idolatry, every other type of sin and every other type of, of situation, a prophet is able to push aside Torah. So the, the, the prophet comes to the, the, the person who Moner believes to be a prophet, comes to him and tells him, you're now allowed to sacrifice outside of the, of the Mishkan, outside of Shilai. And Moner says, it's a prophet. Fantastic. I will listen to him. And now suddenly, this prophet goes walking into the fire, disappears and never seen again. And suddenly Moner realizes this wasn't a prophet, it was an angel. An angel has no jurisdiction to change laws. An angel isn't allowed to change Torah. And now he realizes, I had no business making that, making that sacrifice. That sacrifice was an absolute sin because only a prophet could make this pushing aside of a law. An angel most certainly cannot. So he says, I'm going to die, die twice. Once in this world for seeing that whole angel experience. And number two in the next world for bringing a sacrifice outside of the Mishkan. There's a brilliant, a brilliant um uh, explanation of Avas Yonasan. So, of course, what's the answer? So, her answer is actually the answer to the question. She says that the fact that Hashem accepted the Korban means you don't have to worry about the everlasting death in the next world. Hashem accepted it, which means obviously this was in, in line. And yes, it, usually this isn't the way that things work, and there isn't angels that are pushing aside Torah. But in this particular case, Hashem accepted it. If this was something that was outside of the lines of Torah, something in which we have to experience. Um, Pun everlasting death in the next world, this would be obviously something Hashem wouldn't accept. A beautiful note that Shimshon, of course, was born, and we're going to deal with that in the next podcast. In addition to that, after Shimshon was born, Manoach and Salal Foynes got pregnant again. And they had a, this time they had a daughter, and they named her Nashyam. 
So it's really interesting, a very interesting little tidbit that in addition to Shimshon, who we're going to begin his story in the next podcast, they also had a little baby girl. Thank you for listening to Untold Stories of the Torah. If you enjoyed this episode, help us spread the word by subscribing to this channel and leaving us a review.